And now the end is here, and so I face the final curtain. My friends, the Anchoridion, we've covered it all except for the final chapter. The final episode about Epictetus in this series on Stoicism, which has been running for weeks, which does not get the number of views that the fountain pen reviews do, but that gets incredibly positive comments from many people, and that is definitely a reason to continue. We go over the Enchiridion and the translation, How to Be Free by Professor A. A. Long, and we have one chapter left, chapter 53, and that is a, a short and fascinating chapter because it's basically just three quotes to send you on your way, and we will talk about those. Chapter 53. On every occasion, we should have the following quotations to hand. Lead me, O Zeus, and you, O destiny, wherever you have ordained for me. I will follow unflinching. But if grown bad, I should refuse. I will follow, nonetheless. That is from the Hymn of Zeus by Cleanthes, the second head of the Stoa, which is actually a poem that we, we have. We actually have a little bit of Cleanthes' writing, and the, the Hymn of Zeus is one of them. The second quote is from uh, Evripides, or Euripides, I think, or Euripides, whatever you would like to pronounce that name as. Whosoever complies nobly with necessity, we count as wise, and knowing things divine. And the final um, two quotes are by Plato, assigned to Socrates. Well, Crito, if it, my death, is pleasing to the gods, so let it be. And then a quote about uh, two of Socrates' prosecutors. Anitis and Miletus can kill me, but they cannot harm me. And that's the end of the Enchiridion. Now... I think these quotes are not chosen randomly. I think Epictetus had a point with this because they seem very disjointed. But when you think about it, these kind of cover three themes that we have been talking about for the past weeks. And I want to summarize those themes because what's better than a review session at the end of your course? So first, this, this hymn of Cleanthes. This is clearly about... Um, accepting your fate, right? Wherever you have ordained for me, I will follow unflinching. And even if grown bad, I should refuse, I will follow you nonetheless. Accept your fate. So in my mind, this is part of the stoic principle of action. Stoic principle of action. That is one of the themes we've talked about. In other words, how to behave. Well, the Stoics have a clear answer to that. Virtuously. Whatever you do, you do it virtuously. The most important thing for that life of evdemonia, the life of happiness, of satisfaction, a rich and fulfilling life, you cannot have that without virtue, without doing the right thing. And remember, we talked about those four principles of virtue. Wisdom, uh, there is justice, there is courage and there is temperance, doing things in moderation. And I genuinely believe that, irrespective of whether you believe in Stoicism or whether you think Stoicism is a good or a bad idea of something to pursue, if you try to apply those four things in your life, in all of your actions, how can you not do well if you try to do things wisely, if you try to be courageous, if you try to do things in a way that is just, and if you try to do things in moderation, can anyone really object to that? Is there anyone who would say, well, moderation is bad, you should definitely overeat all the time, do everything in excess, everything you do, uh, spend money in excess, everything. I don't think anyone would say that. I also don't think anyone would say, well, you should be as cowardly as you can be. Don't be courageous, that's just stupid. I don't think anyone would, would do that, and we could have long debates about what those things mean in every context or situation, but I think as guiding principles, they're very important. So that was Cleanthes in action. Now we have Euripides, whosoever complies nobly with 
necessity we count as wise and knowing things divine. Well, isn't that a little bit of the discipline of, of desire in Stoicism? What we started out with, some things are within your control and some things are outside of your control. And that's okay. That's the way life works. But if you des decide to desire those things that are outside of your control, you're setting yourself up for a life of suffering and misery and, and unhappiness, not a life of eudaimonia, because why, why would your life be good if you pursue those things that are outside of your control that may be unattainable to you? Then you will suffer. And bear in mind something we talked about at some point. This doesn't mean that you should say, oh, outside my control, tough luck. No, really ascertain whether something is or is not within your control. And if you want to attain something, you'll have to work hard for that. And maybe something that appears to be outside of your control turns out to very much be within your control. But you can only find out whether it is by really pursuing things, by really doing things, by really making the right decisions, by really assessing your, your situation and then if you truly conclude that something is really outside of your control well then maybe not pursue it maybe not desire it and then finally we have these two beautiful and lovely sort of paradoxical quotes by uh, Plato slash Socrates or assigned attributed to Socrates well Crito if my death is pleasing to the gods so let it be Okay, well, that's a matter of uh, assent, right? The discipline of assent. I assent to this emotion. If this is my time to die, it is my time to die. And that's a very extreme thing to accept, right? But the Stoics would absolutely say, yeah, but that's how things are. Your time will come, and that's it. Now, this the final one. Anitis and Miletus can kill me, but they cannot harm me. Yeah, that's a very Socratic statement, right? Like, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. Yeah, that's clearly very paradoxical. If they kill you, then surely they're harming you. But the point, the point made is that you have to distinguish between these things. And again, this is a matter of assent. Uh, of, well, you can... I think that's this, this is somewhere from one of the discourses from Epictetus. You, you could incarcerate me, but you can't take away my liberty. I always have that liberty of mind. My mind is always free. No matter how you chain me up, no matter how you, you put me in the smallest jail cell you have, my mind is always free. I'm always in charge of my choices. I can make choices. For example, the choice to do the virtuous thing and not the thing of vice. I can choose to pursue those things within my control, but not those things outside of my control. And I can choose to give certain emotions assent. Yes, I feel a flash of anger, but maybe I can say, is this worth getting angry over? And most of the time, the answer will be no, it is not. Take it easy, relax, no big deal. And you continue. And if you start to do that, that is something that, for me, I was very prone to, to feeling these flashes of anger and being angry. That has definitely diminished a lot since I've been really trying to apply stoic principles to my life. Right? And same thing with, with sadness. You, you become a lot less prone to feeling sad all the time if you really continuously challenge your thoughts rationally and ask yourself if this really is something to be angry about or sad about or disappointed about, if this really is something that he or she should be doing or should not be doing, right? Stoicism is a matter of rational thought and continuously correcting your thoughts by yourself and you can do that, everyone can do that with practice. But you have to do it. You have to do it. And um, I think that in this series I have tried to make that clear. You are in charge of your own life. And not just your life, but your, your psyche, your thoughts, your emotions. You are in charge. But you have to take charge. Only then will you actually lead that life of Evlimonia, which is in reach for everyone. But you have to do it. You have to do it. And I, uh, 
I recently was reading one of uh, Seneca's essays. This one's called De Ira, which means on anger. He describes anger, how, how to deal with anger, how, how not to be angry or be angry less. And um, it contains a beautiful quote that sums up, I think, all of Stoicism. Sola sublimis et excelsa virtus est. Only virtue is sublime and exalted. And if we're going to uh, uh, bring in a bit of um, Marcus Aurelius from Gladiator movie, everything else is shadows and dust. Virtue is what matters. And if you make virtue a guiding principle in your life, in your actions, in your thoughts, in everything you say or do or think, here's the deal. You probably will never become a sophos. You will not become a stoic sage or a sage in any matter because there are no sages. None of us is perfect. And the stoics knew this full well. They idolize some people like Socrates or like Diogenes the Cynic, but no Stoic of these big authors, not Seneca, not Marcus Aurelius, not Epictetus, not Musonius Rufus, none of them said, I am a sage, so follow me, like Epicurus, for example, did. He considered himself enlightened. The Stoics did not. They knew this. We're all imperfect, and that's okay. You can be imperfect. Maybe you will never be a sage, but that's okay. You don't have to be a sage. You can be a spudeos. A virtuous person. Someone who makes virtuous decisions. And even then you will slip up sometimes because we all do. But I think that is something you can aspire to be. Be the best version of yourself. In every decision you make, in every thing you say, in every thing you decide to do. Be the best version of yourself. And then, if you really tell yourself that, today, I may not be the best version I can be, but I'm going to try to be the best person I can be. You can never fail. Because as long as you sincerely try to be that best person, you're doing what you told yourself you would do. And that is a statement that is within your control. That is an action, that is an aspiration that is within your control. I may not be the best person I can be, but I'm going to try. I'm going to try everything I can to maybe help others, to say nice things, to not be mean, to not do things that are clearly unvirtuous. I will try every day again. You can't disappoint yourself. Because you may not succeed, but you can always try. That is entirely within your control. In the past weeks, we have gone over the entire Enchiridion. I can honestly say that that is a book that changed my life, and I've received a lot of very positive comments from many of you. And some of them were downright heartwarming. People talked about very unpleasant things that have happened in their lives or that are going on in their lives and that this video series has been so helpful to them. Well, that is, that's a great honor and a privilege. All, I, all I've tried to do is, is, is make or expose people to something they might not know about but that I found very helpful. And uh, that process has been so interesting and so fascinating that I think that I, I'm not yet ready to stop. So what I will do next is I will go over um, the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. However, the Meditations are a very different book from the Enchiridion, where the Enchiridion is sort of a, a Coles Notes version of, of Epictetus' lectures, a, a very strongly abbreviated, summarized, simplified form. The Meditations were written by an emperor as a diary to himself, and some of the entries in the diary are utterly incomprehensible. I don't think anyone in the world knows what Marcus Aurelius was trying to say because the words simply don't make sense to anyone but the person who wrote them who was writing to himself. However, there are absolutely beautiful passages in the meditations. I will seek those out and every week we will try to go over one. 
I hope that will be useful to people. That's going to be very different, but there are very clear themes in Marcus Aurelius, so I think we can all benefit from that. That's all for the Enchiridion. I hope this was useful. Catch you on the flip side with the Emperor.